In this video, we look at some screenwriting and filmmaking lessons from The Mummy. So put on your favorite mummy shirt and let's do this. Before we get into it, I want to give a big thank you to our Patreon supporters. Thank you, Janice, for becoming one of our heroes. As I was gearing up to write the prequel season of Ithaca the miniseries, I knew Daddy, I wanted why to- why you're wearing mommy's shirt? Because <laughs> it makes my beard look bigger. Baby. No, it doesn't. Go to your bedroom. Come on. <laughs> right, that's more like it. Yeah. As I was gearing up to write the prequel season of Ithaca the miniseries, I knew I wanted to focus on the adventure genre. So I listened to all the old radio serials from the 40s. I listened to the incredible transcript from the Raiders Conference where Lucas Spielberg and Kasdan came together to write the story of Raiders of the Lost Ark. I played through Tomb Raider and Uncharted. I revisited Arthurian legend and the Odyssey. And of course I watched the Indiana Jones movies over and over and over. They are my favorite movies and there are tons of video essays on the brilliance of those movies and the filmmaking and behind the scenes. I've watched all of those. However, there is one remarkable movie that accomplishes several things that you don't see in a lot of movies today. That is, of course, Stephen Summers' 1999 blockbuster hit, The Mummy. <coughs> <coughs> that film manages to balance several genres. It's incredibly well-paced, the charm of its lead characters is undeniable, and it is just so much fun. And it's really one of the best horror adventure films there is, and it, it, it still holds, it holds up like a, a uh, it holds up like, uh, it holds up like someone raising the roof. It, f that was so bad. Ah, that was so bad. And the film still holds up. However, there's not a lot of videos or essays that break down how the movie was able to accomplish what it did. There's not a video analysis on the cinematography or the, the script, other than a lot of YouTube reviewers who are gushing about how much we still love the film. So I wanted to see what I could learn from the script in the movie that hasn't already been said by reviewers. And I was looking for things that probably aren't the most obvious. Now this is not a full analysis of the movie. Like I mentioned earlier, I wanted to see what kind of information that I could get from the filmmaking and the script that could inspire me as I was writing the pilot episode for the prequel season of Ithaca. Let's jump into it. There were a number of ways that I could break down the script and movie to analyze it, but I wanted to try something different. I wanted to use Seth Worley's story clock. If you haven't heard of it, filmmaker Seth Worley created a method in which he clocks and dissects movies. Essentially, you look at a movie as if it were a 60 minute analog clock. You'd mark down the time code of what you'd consider main story beats, and you'd end up with a visual representation of not just where the act breaks are, but also the themes, character moments, story arcs, depending on how detailed you want to go. And the idea is to have a visual representation of the story's rhythm and see how certain beats are set up and paid off throughout the story. Seth Worley, he states that strong stories have strong rhythm. And in The Mummy, it's hard to find a moment where you look away. So I went through the movie and the script minute by minute to see what it looks like. The Mummy is a two hour movie. And if you were looking at the story clock, the main beats happen almost exactly where you think they would. The fight on the boat where they lose the map and Rick says he's the map happens exactly on the 30 minute mark. They find the sarcophagus of Imhotep at exactly the 45 minute mark. Evie reads from the book and wakes up Imhotep exactly at the midpoint at the one hour mark. This happens over and over with sharp precision. But I couldn't just stop there. I wrote down a beat for almost every single minute because there was something important happening at almost every single minute. And it wasn't just exposition or a story beat that I wrote down. There were character revealing moments and themes that I hadn't noticed before. There wasn't a lot of fat in these scenes either. If you read the script, Stephen Summers conveys a lot of information onto a single page. He conveys action into a single short but descriptive sentence. It's almost like a condensed shot list. The dialogue for a scene doesn't go longer than a page, which translates into about a minute on screen. And there are several short shots, sometimes only two seconds long, that fully captures the essence of a character. And they're just interspersed throughout the movie. We'll get into some of those character details later on in the video. 
But this is what stood out to me the most, that Stephen Summers is so economical and so efficient. You may also notice that Seth's story clock may remind you of the structure of Joseph Campbell's hero's journey. And in this movie, the hero's journey is present, but you'll see that Evie is really the one who follows the traditional hero's journey, even though the movie opens with Imhotep's tragic fate, as well as Rick's adventures in Hamanaptra, you'll see that it's her story if you follow that format. My good friend Jamie Nash, who wrote Save the Cat Writes for Television, which you can get on Amazon. Here's your plug, buddy. He had mentioned to me that Stephen Summers would often work on his script together with his editor, Bob Duxay. I think that's how you pronounce it. And it really looks like having an editor view that script so early on was so helpful. They can visualize together what needs to be trimmed down or what sections are going to be weaved together and if information can be delivered in a more efficient way. This help with the editor is clear in the section of the story when everyone is inside Hamanatra and you have three different journeys weaving together. Each character has already been well established by this point and each character feels that they have something to gain from Hamanatra and their demise sets up the dangers of the location, the dangers of the objects that they're dealing with, and the future dangers they may run into. It heightens the stakes, and that section is weaved together extremely well. So it's worth remembering that each of the characters you introduce aren't just there to just follow along and say yes to the core characters. They take active steps in their own separate journeys to get closer to their own goals, and we can relish in the demise of those characters when they fail. For the Warden, his death by the Scarab sets up the section where Jonathan is being attacked at the climax. We've seen what they can do, but it leads to O'Connell shooting his gun, which is his solution to everything. But it's this shooting of the gun that alerts Imhotep to bring his other mummy buddies back to life. It's a great callback to an earlier section, but it also sets up Imhotep taking the steps to protect himself so that he can accomplish his own goals. So once again, it weaves together so, so well. It's a beautiful tapestry. <clears throat> yep. The story clock also helped me appreciate the rhythm of the romance in the movie as well. There's horror and adventure and comedy, but the love story started to take on much more weight. And a theme that came up a lot was the idea of stolen, interrupted, and missed kisses. The first kiss of the movie is a mutual kiss between Imhotep and Anaxunamun two minutes into the film. However, it is a forbidden kiss. Ardith Bay states that for their love, they were willing to risk life itself. And on screen, this marks the beginning of the end for the two. The second kiss is a stolen kiss that Rick steals from Evie when he's in the prison at the 21 minute mark. The third is a failed kiss that Evie tries to give Rick before she passes out. 53 minutes into the film. The fourth is a failed kiss that Imhotep tries to give Evie before he is interrupted by a cat playing the piano like Ray Charles. One hour and 13 minutes into the film. The fifth kiss is a stolen kiss that Imhotep gives Evie when she's sleeping at the one hour and 21 minute mark. The sixth kiss is the one that Evie steals from Imhotep to distract him from killing Rick at the one hour and 34 minute mark. Now this is interesting because this kiss was not written this way originally in the script. On page 94, Imhotep grabs her, pulls her close, her beautiful eyes stare into his shockingly intense ones, then he kisses her, hard. Evelyn's eyes widen, stunned and mesmerized, then she pushes herself away and falls back into the sand. Imhotep laughs. I'm gonna talk about this specific change later on in the video. Then finally, we have the last kiss between Rick and Evie at the very, very end of the movie at an hour and 56. It's a mutual kiss that marks the beginning for these two. And if you want, you can throw in Jonathan's failed attempt with a camel. So what does this all mean? So what? We have a whole bunch of kisses that could have happened and kisses that did happen. And what's, what's the big deal about it? Well, those kisses are important because we're seeing what is marked at the very, very beginning of the film with a forbidden kiss by a couple that is willing to risk life itself for their love find its true resolution and mirrored counterpart by the mutual kiss between Rick and Evie having just risked their life for their love. It's not just the setup of a, a bickering couple that's thrown together and you know that they're ultimately going to make out because they find each other super attractive. The movie started with a forbidden connection of intimacy that needs to be resolved. Each kiss and each attempted kiss in the story had a different personality and weight to it. 
And I'm going to go into some detail later in the video about some of the changes that they made uh, with those kisses to make the story flow much better. So I have a theory when it comes to um, setting up horror in your horror films. To really have your horror have an impact on your audience, you need to familiarize them with the location or the destination as soon as you can. And I don't mean just filming it as, uh, as an establishing shot. You need to calibrate all of the senses an audience has to that location. You need to create the visceral experience of what it's like to be in there. Then when you return to that familiar location and introduce whatever uh, evil entity there is, their senses become more heightened and highly focused because they are trying to comprehend this world viscerally now that evil has been introduced. Something is amiss. Some examples are the swooping shot from The Conjuring that familiarizes you with the whole house. Uh, that goes in the living room. Hey, Andrea, yeah. where's my wind shine? Uh, I think Nancy's got it in the other room. Oh, thanks. Hey, Nancy, have you seen my... The base from The Thing? The script goes into a great detail describing the blueprints of the place. The apartment building of wreck and quarantine. Woman was screaming bloody murder back there. It's Mrs. Espinosa. There's two cops uh, up there already. When did they get here? Five minutes ago. Okay, right. What's that sound? It does the sound of the building. It's very old. Because he insists on fixing everything himself. Wow. Everything! It's locked. The mummy does this right from the get-go, and it does it quite a bit. We are introduced to Hamanopcha very, very early on, and we get an idea of how it looks through our senses. The horrific screams of people who've been tortured during mummification. How the wind whips through the tunnels. How the light plays off the walls, the shapes, the hallways, the corridors. We're introduced to that sense of claustrophobia. And then once our heroes make it to Hamanoptera, we are reintroduced to those locations, but with a new stimuli. It could be a sound, or the overwhelming darkness in a familiar hallway, or a familiar camera angle. You can see that your brain is being calibrated to accept what it first sees, and then when we return, our senses are heightened and vigilant and prepared and uh, alert to this new sense of dread. So look at some of these examples from The Mummy. And once again, pay attention to how your senses respond to the part A calibration, and then the return to that same location in part B. Let yourself experience the tools that the filmmaker uses. Thank <laughs> you. 
you can see that the movie does this a lot and that it helped giving the audience a sense of geography of the location in a place that can really feel like a labyrinth. So I really want to play around with implementing this for further episodes of Ithaca uh, as there's a lot of world building. All right, let's talk about the introduction of characters. In a lot of movies and TV series, uh, a character is introduced by having another character pretty much reading off their credentials. You've got the tough new female detective who's coming in, and then you got the two captains who are off to the side talking to each other, reading off her resume. Oh yeah, Martinez, top of her class in Quantico. She did two tours in Afghanistan with first group special forces, and she's got a purple heart from Hogwarts. I don't know, you think she's up for the task? And then you see some tough character giving her a hard time, and then she breaks his arm. Then the two captains look at each other and go, <laughs> I think she'll fit right in. Ah! You're seeing it a lot in the pilots of television shows now. So if you haven't noticed, I'm a very big fan of this. Ah! So The Mummy does something with its introductions that I really, really love. And it's all in this nonverbal communication, which you know that I'm a fan of. If you've seen Ithaca, you know I love that nonverbal communication. What they do in The Mummy is they try to distill a character to the very core of who they are by an action. And it's within the first five seconds of meeting them. And we understand instinctually who that character really is within that beat and without being told who they are. Imhotep is the exception, and that's because the story is trying to get the audience to understand the location, the legend, the rites and rituals that we are unaccustomed to. But let's take a look at how our core characters are introduced so that you can understand them instinctively and immediately. In Rick, we have a fighter who can lead those around him regardless of the odds are stacked so against him. With Benny, we have a coward who looks to serve his own safety and interest. In Evie, we have an intelligent scholar who doesn't recognize the dangers of the situation she puts herself in. And we have her brother, Jonathan, who doesn't fit in with social norms, but seeks that one score that will put him ahead in life. We get these within the first 10 seconds of their introductions, and it's really by their actions. It's such efficient storytelling, and they feel fleshed out without feeling like caricatures. But what makes this even more impressive is when we remember how big the rest of the cast is, and that they each have defined character journeys. We have the American competitors, the prison warden, Ardeth Bay, Winston. There's a lot of them, and yet they all feel and look distinct. They all have something to gain by this journey, and we also get to spend time experiencing their agony and horrors when they fail. These characters aren't just introduced so they can be killed. They each do something that moves the plot forward. This is something that Steven Summers does really well. He sets up strong groups, each with distinct personalities. And we saw it in his prior film, Deep Rising. Each character is given the appropriate amount of time for them to feel lived in, even if it's in small actions or dialogue that lasts two seconds. And it's enough to let the audience know that there's a social dynamic and hierarchy between the characters. One of my favorite examples of this is when Mr. Daniels is grabbed from the car and calls for Rick's help. Oh no! Oh no! Earlier in the movie, we had seen Mr. Daniels shooting the Magi and facing danger with a hoot and a holler, but now that he is in the most danger he's ever felt for his life, he calls out to the one he feels safest with, Rick. And it's a bit tragic that Rick isn't able to pull through. Now on a different note, uh, something that made me curious is what you can call the wound. Uh, as actors, when we create characters, sometimes we explore a character's core wound. What happened to them that drives them to do what they do? And sometimes it's a, a traumatic moment from their childhood. Uh, so we create these elaborate backstories that are all attached to this sense of pain. And a lot of times in movies, we have scenes where characters go into the monologue to explain what this moment was. Uh, and it's usually a sad moment. It's usually a very sober moment. It's usually about halfway to three quarters into the film. And as actors, we do these scenes a lot for auditions. It's where we get the monologues. And it's an opportunity for the actor to show our, our vulnerable, raw side, our, our, our skills at sense memory. 
and you can picture all the scenes where someone is in a support group sharing what this wound is in, uh, in a monologue. But like I said, it's usually a sorrowful point of the film. The, the pace slows down, and it's, a, it's, and it's usually to get the audience to understand and empathize with our character and our needs and understand why we do what we do. We have a moment that is very close to this when Evie shares the pictures of her parents to Rick. Typically in a scene like this, where the character is showing their vulnerabilities, the actor chews up the scene with tears and pain. The rhythm and pace of the film may slow down to add more gravity to what is being said. And yet, in The Mummy, this scene is played in a way where you don't really notice a wound. And sure, you can say that it was because she was drunk. However, Rachel didn't play it as a sad, vulnerable, bitter drunk. It wasn't a scene about sharing a traumatic death of her parents, or a longing for justice, or picking up the mantle. We don't even see the picture that she is showing Rick on the necklace. There's no scene where the necklace has a tremendous amount of emotional weight and she's about to lose it. Rachel Weiss plays the scene where there is a joy and an excitement to connect with Rick. And you can see this in her reaction when Rick gives her the permission to call him Rick. And it's beautifully done. Uh, Rachel, she just crushes this scene and uh, makes some choices that I think other actors would have gone for the most obvious choice, which is playing the wound. This movie was very successful at getting us to empathize without going into detail about the wound. We didn't need to see one for Rick. We didn't see his painful years inside prison or an abusive father who abandoned him. We didn't see a wound for John and the failures in life that made him turn to drinking and become a social outcast. And yet we feel so connected to them. And I think it's so fascinating that the movie accomplishes this. And this is interesting, especially when we compare it to a very similar movie, The Jungle Cruise. There are some very similar characters, and that movie does stop for some of the characters to share their emotional backstory in intimate moments. And I don't just mean exposition. Those scenes were supposed to make you feel closer to the characters. And yet, for me, they didn't ring true. Wound scenes can definitely affect the pace of the film, and sometimes they don't add to pushing the story forward. Which is why the way Rachel played her scene was so brilliant. It kept the momentum up, it kept the scene fun, and still managed to bring us closer to her. So this made me curious, and I want to get your thoughts on this. In television, it can be said that the goal of the screenwriter is to open the wound for the character and to pour salt into it. So if there was a television series of The Mummy filled in the exact same style, pace, same actors, same director, would we eventually want to see the story stop for characters to share their wound in one of the episodes so we could feel more connected to a character? Would we want the story to stop for a character to justify their actions to another character based on something from their past? Or do you think the Mummy TV series could successfully do without it like the movie managed to do? And I want to be clear, I'm not against backstory that fleshes out characters or leads to conflict in the future or gives you a better understanding or appreciation of the motivations of characters. The moment just managed to accomplish something different very effectively where a lot of other movies stumble. So leave a comment below, let me know what you think. So there are some differences between the original script and the final cut of the movie, and I want to discuss a few of them. In the original script, the introduction is narrated by Imhotep, and he describes who he is, the situation, and what he had to do to bring Anak Sinamun back to life. And he also goes into further detail about the sacred scarabs that I thought was interesting. Essentially, he says that by eating the sacred scarabs, he would be cursed to live forever, and that they, by eating him, would be cursed to do the same. We know the movie changes the intro to Ardeth Bay narrating, which solidifies that the Magi have long been watchers over this land. Another change was the introduction for Rick and Benny. Originally, we start with Rick on top of a wall, staring at the horsemen racing towards Hamanoptera. Benny is a doughy little Frenchman who joins him, and they have a small exchange where Rick essentially takes all of Benny's ammo and weapons. He calls Benny a coward by saying that he should tie a stick to his back so it looks like he has a spine. Rick then runs down to the front lines, but stops to ask Benny how he ended up in the French Foreign Legion and Benny responds with saying that he was caught robbing a synagogue. He also mentions the seven languages he speaks. 
Then he asks Rick how he was conscripted, and Rick responds with a dashing smile, saying he was just looking for a good time. The movie made a great move by condensing all of this exposition and character building into a simple moment. The captain fleeing, Benny fleeing for his life, but Rick staying in the front lines to lead against impossible odds. The original script also has Rick running from the Tuaregs, turning and giving them the middle finger before he's about to be shot. It was a nice change to see Rick squeezing his eyes together and looking away, like he actually does fear death. He closes his eyes, bracing for impact like a child that doesn't want to see the doctor giving him a shot. And it's a great transition to see Rick slowly open his eyes again and be confused at the unexpected turn of events. I like seeing the side of Rick so early in the movie as opposed to what they have in the original script. Uh, a character who rushes to the front lines, calls others cowards, takes their ammunition and has a piss in the wind cavalier face death with a fuck you attitude. That creates Rick as more of a hardened swashbuckler. When Brendan Fraser actually brings a charming, comedic, and vulnerable side to a character who does battle danger over and over. And there's actually two important changes with the kisses in the script. Originally, Rick polishes off a bottle of whatever they're drinking, and he leans in to kiss Evie, and she kisses back, and then slumps into his arms. It definitely resonated more in the movie that they don't actually kiss, and that Rick is a little uncomfortable with taking advantage of her in this state. And of course, we have that incredibly important switch of Evie stealing the kiss from Imhotep to distract him during the sandstorm. This gave her a much more active part in the scene, as opposed to what they originally had with Imhotep grabbing her, kissing her, and then throwing her off to the side. It's even more important that she did this if you view Evie as the one who takes the arc of the traditional hero's journey. With this change, it completely throws Imhotep for a spin as he's been aching for that intimate moment since coming back to life. She stops the most powerful character in the story with a kiss and she does it to save the one that she truly loves, Rick and her brother. So what I'm getting at is that details matter. As a filmmaker, you have to be mindful of every single small detail, even if it's just a gesture. And if you're not a filmmaker, these may seem insignificant, but this movie made those small changes that have a huge impact on how the audience perceives these characters and why we love them. So it's nice to see that there's a sense of freedom and a willingness to deviate from the script to make things more impactful. And that has happened so much in the process of making Ithaca. Now, as much as I enjoy the movie, there are some faults. With so much information to get across to the audience and with the intense pace that the film moves at, there are some details that didn't make it from script to screen that would have helped our understanding of what was going on or, or, or helped us appreciate certain beats. There are a lot of objects, rules, and important details in the movie, and it's difficult to keep track of the significance of everything. We have the key, which inside has the map. We have the Book of the Dead and the Book of the Living, which are opposite to each other, and those are buried at the feet of two different gods. In the original script, we also have the first mummification of a Naksuna moon, and him describing that a human sacrifice is not needed to bring her back to life because her organs are still fresh, so it feels confusing as to why he's raising the knife, we don't quite know what he's doing, or that Anaxuna Moon's body was reburied, I guess, at Hamunaptra, and I don't know how they found that body. We also miss that one of the canopic jars is shattered because the head mummia shatters it when they capture Imhotep, and inside the jar is Anaxuna Moon's beating heart. It's also written in the script that Daniels gets shot in the arm, but we missed that beat and we just see him grabbing his arm and hiding his shoulder in a sling. And so many of us have thought that Rick should have stormed Hamanoptra with a cat in his backpack. And we've all thought this because we missed a quick statement that is mentioned only once. Well, cats are the guardians of the underworld. You will fear them until he is fully regenerated. Cats have no effect on the mummy once he's fully regenerated. That's an important note that happened so fast. And there's a wonderful beat in the script that I love that describes the first time Rick has shown genuine concern for Evie and the excitement that she has for being so physically close to him. It's a lovely, intimate moment in the script, and it's a great moment for Evie. Rachel Weiss does play this beat. However, I felt that the excitement of this moment and the intimacy that Evie feels 
is lost with it being a wide shot into a medium as opposed to a couple of close-ups that could have really sold this moment. And who knows why that moment wasn't shot. Scheduling for a movie is extremely challenging, especially if you're dealing with a night shoot and daylight becomes a concern. Or perhaps after that action sequence with a lot of quick edits, they wanted to slow things down with a longer shot. Or perhaps they wanted to keep that Casablanca romantic epic pose that those two were striking. It's really a joy to visit this movie over and over. The movie doesn't get old, and, and what a testament to a movie to be able to do that. And it's for that reason that it's worth viewing this movie from as many different angles as possible and uh, mining it for whatever possible inspiration or knowledge that's in there. So I, I, I'm, I'm super excited to implement several of these things into Ithaca. If you enjoyed this, please like and subscribe and leave a comment about your thoughts on the movie. And check out the first season of Ithaca the miniseries if you haven't already, and please share it. Word of mouth has been at the heart of this series, and we're so grateful for everyone who has, um, who's enjoyed it and shared it and supported us and want to see more. We will be releasing the proof of concept of the prequel season in just a few weeks. Stay tuned. We'll see you in the arena.